Well, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. Only in Europe. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Silvestri. I'm the publisher of the Richmond Times Dispatch and the moderator of the Public Square. And I had a phone call earlier this week that said nobody was going to come to this conversation. <laughs> Thank you for proving us correct. <laughs> well, the Public Square is our initiative in fostering a civil and respectful conversation of items of importance to the, the greater Richmond area. And today, this is our 56th public square. Oh, thank you for that reaction. We say wow also. Thank you. <laughs> and in this one, we're going to explore with your help the issue of modern day segregation in the region. We coincidentally have picked this topic because April is National Fair Housing Month. And one of our most delightful public squares in our history of public squares has included one on affordable housing, one of the more animated, insightful, and instructive public conversations we've ever had. So in broad strokes today, why is Richmond still segregated? We'll explore the history. We'll understand some answers. We'll take some questions. And we'll explore reasons. Uh, we'll start by having a conversation with four speakers. Today, uh, we, we abandoned the traditional panel conversation, so two of our speakers are up on the stage and two of our speakers are in the uh, audience. Some people might call that innovation. But with us today, well, it is Richmond. Um, but two of our speakers, uh, four of our speakers are with us today. We have a renowned professor of urban studies who's been at this issue for many years. We have an attorney and an advocate for fair housing. We have a banking executive who has orchestrated programs to reward neighborhood progress. And also with us is probably one of the main reasons you read the Times-Dispatch, <coughs> a longtime journalist who writes about Richmond from the perspective of being a native Richmonder. We'll hear from all these, three, uh, all these observers I'll introduce each of them before their segments, and then we'll open up the public square to your questions and insights. The motto is keep it short, look at the audience. We can't afford war and peace here. If you have a great question, realize that somebody else may have another great question, so stick to one, stick to a coherent moment. I'm going to ask this question. I always do to open up the public square. <coughs> How many are here for the first time? Wow. That is amazing. On behalf of the Richmond Times Dispatch, thank you for that. And you should get a round of applause for that off the, right off the bat. Thank you. Just to give our speakers some perspective, how many are here from the city of Richmond? Okay. How many are here from Henrico? Chesterfield? Hanover? Uh, the other counties, and don't read into them being the outer counties. <laughs> Uh, by process, anybody from New Kent, Goochland, Powhatan, the outer ring, okay, just a couple. Well, thank you very much for making the presentation. Also, the square is 90 minutes, goes from today, in our afternoon show, goes from noon to 1.30. If you um, need something to drink, we have waters in the area, um, and it, no one, if you take a water, no one will call you up at 7.30 and ask you to buy a subscription, I promise you that. <laughs> promise you that. If you can hear, please let us know. Sometimes the microphones go out of whack. Uh, what, we, what we found is that a, a hearing crowd is a good crowd. We don't want you to leave here saying, I didn't hear a word those people said. So if you can't hear in the back, let me know. For those standing, we'll try to find you some seats. Um, so often we use the training room tool on my left as a spillover. So okay, ready for the public square? Let's go. So let me introduce our first speaker. John, why don't you make your way up? Uh, John Miser a senior fellow at the Bonner Center for Civic Engagement at the University of Richmond and a professor emeritus of urban studies and planning at VCU. He's bipolar. He's worked at two of our uh, universities in town. You can only put <laughs> John, gives an over John will give an overview of what led to Richmond becoming more segregated in the 20th century than it was in the 18th and 19th. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big welcome for John Miser. Well, I was honored to be invited to participate 
in this program today, and thank you so much for coming. Wow, this is a very good turnout, and I'm pleased that so many are interested in this very, very important subject. It's dangerous for a college professor to be the first speaker among several since we're programmed to speak in 50-minute intervals, uh, the <laughs> typical length of an undergraduate class. So to confine myself to five minutes, I've written out my comments, all five sentences. Um, actually, there are a few more than five sentences, but not many more. Today, Richmond is more segregated than it was in the 19th century. Remember, the 19th century was the period that included institutionalized slavery and led Richmond to become the largest interstate slave market in the South. Yet when you examine 19th century maps that show where African Americans lived, both free and slave, one is struck that the spatial distribution of race was scattered. Domestic servants lived near the places where they worked, sometimes in separate quarters of their master's house. Slave owners who had a surplus of slaves or slaves who otherwise would have been idled after planting and harvesting would hire out slaves to work in Richmond's factories. Slaves had to find their own houses in the city and so they often sought out places closest to work. Fundamentally, however, blacks and whites lived in proximity to each other because for most of the 19th century, Richmond was a small, geographically compact walking city. That didn't change until the last quarter of the century when, as you know, Richmond acquired the first commercially successful streetcar system. The reason we're more segregated today is because of what happened in the 20th century. Blacks were no longer slaves at least in the legal sense, though they were hemmed in by Jim Crow laws that led to what Douglas Blackman, in an excellent book called Slavery by Another Name, that they were hemmed in by Jim Crow laws that for many amounted to slavery. Richmond was the second city in the United States to adopt a race-based zoning code. It's interesting that it was a northern city that first adopted a race-based zoning code. It was Baltimore. In 1910, the city of Richmond zoned neighborhoods by race, neighborhoods for whites and neighborhoods for blacks. It was not long thereafter that the United States Supreme Court ruled that zoning law unconstitutional, but that ruling did not affect private individuals or private businesses, and that's when you begin to see a reliance on private covenants, which I'll talk about in just a moment. In the 1920s, Richmond tried again to zone neighborhoods by race. But instead of referring to people by race, which they couldn't do now under that Supreme Court ruling, the zoning code referred to Virginia's racial integrity law that forbade interracial marriage. People could not live in neighborhoods whose residents they could not marry. Because Virginia forbade interracial marriages, blacks couldn't live in white neighborhoods, or vice versa. One of the most interesting, one of the most troubling of many troubling decades that we've had in this historic city uh, was during the 1920s. 
And that was when the racial integrity law, was, which was part of the eugenics movement that swept through Virginia and other states, north and south. So when the uh, law was adopted, these laws were designed to protect the purity of bloodlines, particularly white blood. Virginians who, who were at the forefront of the eugenics movement corresponded regularly with leaders of the Nazi party in Germany and vice versa. The Nazis found Virginia's law helpful when it was framing its own racial purity laws. And Virginia also barred from the Nazis. Once again, the US Supreme Court intervened ruling that the prohibition against interracial marriage as a justification for segregating neighborhoods was unconstitutional. By the 1930s, Richmond neighborhoods were thoroughly segregated, though the preservation of segregation now fell to local bankers and realtors since the Supreme Court decisions forbade city government to use its own lawmaking authority to separate neighborhoods. Restrictive covenants, which I had mentioned a moment earlier, which had been used for year, uh, years, proved to be particularly effective. These were restrictions written into the deeds of privately owned homes that prohibited white homeowners from selling their houses to blacks and in many instances to Jews. In 1948, the Supreme Court ruled again and nullified the use of these racist covenants. From the 1930s through the early 1960s, one of the major drivers of segregating neighborhoods was none other than the federal government itself. Urban planners were their accomplices. Redlining, the construction of public housing, and the location of public housing, highway construction, urban renewal, and economic development projects destroyed or bisected Richmond's black neighborhoods, displacing thousands of low-income African Americans and squeezing them into East End Richmond where most of the public housing had been located. Today, Richmond is more segregated than ever. This time by race, but more particularly by class. And the distances separating wealth and poverty are unprecedented. Thank you. Thank you. So we start often with the public square with some perspective, and there you have the history. Next up, let me welcome Heather Mullins Chrislip, who is the president and CEO of Housing Opportunities Made Equal. She'll give an overview of the maps, some of which she showed, because John talked with his hands and hit the podium over there, <laughs> almost, almost robbed her of her opening lines, of, of the maps, and kind of a detailed look of what we're talking about from the ground level. Heather? Thank you. It's my mic. Let me do the adjustment. This is the uh, Molly Chris. There you go. Excuse this, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but we'll be all be better off for it. <laughs> there you go. All right. If, and if this this is the backup. Okay, great. I am blown away by this attendance. I really thank, can't thank you enough uh, for being here. The mic's not on, so use All the right. handheld. Use this one? Yeah. OK. Is that working? No. I can probably project. You can hear me? I'll just I'll also talk with enthusiasm. How's that? <laughs> um, and I really wanted to thank the Times-Dispatch for being willing to host this conversation. Uh, it's a topic we don't talk about that often, uh, and it really is incredibly interesting and not that mysterious. Um, and always, uh, I want to thank John Meeser uh, for you know, speaking today, but also for his lifetime of work on the subject. <coughs> My name is Heather Chrislip, and I serve as President and CEO of Housing Opportunities Made Equal, 
also known as HOME. We are one of the oldest and largest private fair housing organizations in the country. And we've made very significant contributions to the national conversation on fair housing and on segregation. You have a booklet that we've handed out that includes some of our history in Richmond and also has the maps that I'll be projecting today. And, I, and if you can't see them with a great amount of detail in the PowerPoint, I wanted you to know that you have them in your hands too. Um, and a few bonus maps thrown in. Segregation isn't an accident of history or a matter of preference or choice. I hope to illuminate parts of the more modern history that brings this to light and that afterwards we can discuss how to create a community that offers the same opportunity for housing and wealth creation to everyone. This is the first map that I want to talk about and it is, is probably the most important one. You'll find it on page 10 in your booklet if you can't see the detail. In the wake of the Great Depression uh, and following a foreclosure crisis just like we experienced recently, the federal government established the Home Owners Loan Corporation or uh, sometimes known as HOLC. Uh, the purpose was to prevent foreclosures and to refinance mortgages. Until that time, mortgages typically were interest only and culminated in a balloon payment, uh, typically about five years after you purchased the home. And you can imagine how that limited everybody's opportunity for home ownership and wealth creation, because not very many middle class or even upper middle class families could accept terms like that and be able to, uh, to manage them. The Hulk provided public underwriting for private mortgages and greatly extended the amortization period from, five to, or from 15 to 25 years, offering a longer time frame for repayment and a lower interest rate. The program is credited for saving over one million homes during the Great Depression uh, and is the foundation of the 30-year standard mortgage that we come to expect today and for the, establishing the home as the wealth creation mechanism for the middle class. It also is credited with coining the phrase redlining. Redlining refers to the practice of denying or charging more for services like banking and insurance in minority neighborhoods. In the case of the Hulk, <coughs> residential security maps, and this is Richmond's residential security map, in 239 cities used red lines to delineate neighborhoods not fit for investment, so unfit to receive underwriting for standard mortgage financing. The Hulk graded neighborhoods based in significant part on their racial composition. Here we've added the earliest population data to the Hulk boundaries to make this very clear. Each white dot uh, signifies a white resident and each purple dot signifies an African American resident. The red outlines that you've seen on the, on the map are those neighborhoods that were, were graded D uh, by the Hulk Corporation in 1933. As seen in the map, those areas outlined in red were graded D and were predominantly African American and found in the inner city and then were, therefore were ineligible for government financed uh, standard loans. Areas labeled type C were classified as working class and contained a larger number of whites. The vast majority of uh, areas graded type A or B were populated solely by whites and were the areas that the Hulk was primarily targeting for, for mortgage underwriting. The underlying racism of the Hulk grading system and the resulting lack of private investment in predominantly African American neighborhoods set, up, set us up with valuation systems for properties that still haunt us today. Neither the income of African Americans living there nor their social class mattered. You can look at Jackson Ward, which is right about here, Jackson Ward, as you know, was considered the black Wall Street of the South. It was home to fabulous uh, housing stock and gamefully employed residents. Uh, but it was graded D and ineligible for, for public underwriting for mortgages. Redlining spread to the entire mortgage industry, excluding African Americans from the most legitimate means of obtaining a mortgage, and the wealth creation and stability that homeownership affords. Every single African American neighborhood in Richmond was graded D and only two non-African American neighborhoods were graded that way, and they were also described as inaccessible or undeveloped. Redlining paralyzed these communities because they could no longer be financed. This meant that they would have lower property values, and others feared the loss of property values if, in their own communities if their only own communities integrated and financing became unavailable. This financial reality fueled fears of integration. 
With plummeting property values in African American neighborhoods and private financing un not available because it couldn't be underwritten, this is the other half of the uh, U.S. housing policy story in Richmond, and John alluded to this. Instead of privately financed opportunities to create wealth through home ownership, there was the development of public housing. As part of Harry Truman's Fair Deal, the Housing Act of 1949 effectively served to concentrate poverty in the inner city through the construction of public housing. By and large, public housing units were constructed in neighborhoods receiving a grade D by the Hulk. Since that time, efforts uh, for federal housing subsidies have been relegated largely to the neighborhoods with the greatest poverty rates, in effect containing poverty to the inner city. This map is also on page 15 of your booklet, and it shows the location of various types of federal housing subsidies for the region as it stands today. Housing Choice Vouchers, uh, a housing mobility program for low-income residents, more commonly known as Section 8, is represented with the black dots. So each black dot is a Housing Choice Voucher holder in the region. Low-income housing tax credit properties, which is a federal tax incentive for the construction of low-income housing units, are the red dots, and the larger the dot, the, uh, the more units in that individual uh, development. And conventional project-based public housing constructed largely in the 40s and 50s are the, are the purple dots. Uh, and again, that's by size of the number of units. The map shows the concentration of federal housing subsidies in the inner city. This focus on pro providing public housing, or housing subsidies to residents most in need in receiving them is not misplaced. However, the unintended consequences of prolonged, concentrated poverty are a serious detriment to the health of the region. And I see we have Michael Herring also here with us today, and I hope he'll talk for a bit about the social consequences of concentrated poverty. This concentration is greatly exacerbated by the lack of a regional public transit system, which prevents residents of all income levels from accessing housing opportunities throughout the region. White flight is the next chapter. Following the United States Supreme Court's decision in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education declared state laws which established separate public schools for black and white children unconstitutional. While Richmond wasn't home to the worst of massive resistance, instead, white families retreated to Henrico and Chesterfield counties in an attempt to resist racial and ethnic integration. These maps, which are on page 13 in your book, attempt to demonstrate this in two ways. The concentration of whites, because each individual green dot, which will show up better in the book, uh, represents about five, 15 white residents in the region. And then the green shaded area represents 75% of the land, uh, I'm sorry, the land area in which 75% of the white population lived. So you can kind of consistently see a, a hollowing out of the inner city through each intervening decade. This was a massive, massive shift. Between 1960 and 1970, the white population in Henrico County increased by 29%. For the following three decades, until 2000, the white population consistently decreased in Richmond. There are whole neighborhoods, like Highland Park, that tur over turned over nearly 100% in 10 years. Blockbusting, a term for the business practice of encouraging whites to sell simply by implying that racial minorities are moving into the neighborhood, was employed. This fear was fueled by the implication of decreased property values, as established by redlining of financial underwriting in the previous decades. In the period between 1970 and 1980, the percentage of whites in Chesterfield increased 85%. And from 1980 to 1990, the percentage increased by 41%. During these same periods, the percentage of whites in Richmond decreased by 27% and 16%, respectively. As Tom mentioned, April is Fair Housing Month, but there's a story behind that as well. This is because Fair, the Fair Housing Act was passed in April of 1968, just one week following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. Preventing housing discrimination had been proposed for years, but had not had the votes to pass or be included in the landmark 1964 Civil Rights Act. Martin Luther King had been a big proponent of fair housing and was conducting testing to demonstrate the rates of housing discrimination uh, just in the, just the weeks prior to his assassination. And Johnson thought that the passage of the act was a fitting memorial as the cities rioted. 
The Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in a housing transaction because of your membership in a protected class. And I've listed up there the, the protected classes. Uh, there are seven plus elderliness in the state of Virginia. The act made redlining illegal, but the practice has continued. And the effects of the decades-long underinvestment left a huge debt in African-American neighborhoods. Home was founded shortly thereafter and quickly established itself as an aggressive enforcer of the act. In the 1980s, we won a U.S. Supreme Court case called Havens versus Coleman that is largely considered one of the most important fair housing cases in the country. It allows private fair housing organizations uh, to challenge racial discrimination in court, establishing the private enforcement of the law, which is still the primary way in which the Fair Housing Act is enforced today. And not so long ago, in 1998, Home also won a, the first redlining case, or I'm sorry, the only redlining case ever to go to trial in Virginia against nationwide insurance for redlining African-American neighborhoods and the provision of homeowners insurance. The jury verdict in that case was the largest award ever in the United States in a fair housing case and was cited for major reforms in the homeowners insurance practice across the country. I'm going to fast forward a few decades now to talk a little bit about the impact in the most recent housing crisis, even though I could talk to you about home for several more hours. The subprime lending spree that precipitated the foreclosure crisis and the near collapse of the U.S. economy had disastrous effects on minority neighborhoods across the country. Touted as a way to expand homeownership opportunities to families that wouldn't qualify for traditional mortgage products, subprime lending had the effect of stripping away any remaining wealth uh, in minority neighborhoods. Remember that traditional financing has historically been difficult to obtain in these communities. But now there is another threat, and that is reverse redlining, which is the targeting of minority communities for inferior loan products. This is a map of subprime mortgages made in Richmond between 2005 and 2009, so the height of the housing bubble. And it's on page 17. And it's according to publicly available mortgage data, from 2004 to 2011, 107,000 home mortgages were originated for owner-occupied purchases in the Richmond region. And I'll just add the gradation here, the, the darker green, the higher percentage of, of minorities in those census tracts. <coughs> of those 107,000 loans, 12% or about 13,000 were considered subprime. Comparing these loans against the minority composition of the neighborhoods in which they were made reveals startling disparities. Subprime loans accounted for just 5% of the total number of loans made in neighborhoods having less than 20% minority population. In contrast, subprime loans con constituted 31% of the total number of loans in neighborhoods having greater than 20% minority population. Not only is it clear that minorities who got loans were more likely to receive a subprime loan than their white counterparts, they were also more likely to be denied outright. In 2006, at the height of the lending frenzy, blacks were denied home purchase loans nearly 19% of the time, compared to just 6% of whites. Nationally, the Center for Responsible Lending found that even taking into account individual credit scores and other characteristics, Hispanic and African-American borrowers were more than 30% more likely to receive a subprime loan, regardless of their credit. This is the other half of the housing crisis story. With subprime loans, we ended up with large numbers of foreclosures. Subprime mortgages nationally made up for about 60% of the foreclosures during the housing crisis. The subprime mortgage lending industry was, by and large, non-selective when it came to originating inferior mortgage products, and the majority of subprime loans made in the region were to whites because they make up a large majority of the overall market, uh, mortgage market. However, there are numerous high-profile examples that exist that show that subprime lenders purposefully targeted minority neighborhoods and communities throughout the country. In Richmond, our segregated housing patterns, subprime lending, the collapse of the economy, and the resultant foreclosure epidemic disproportionately impacted African-American neighborhoods in our region. The map of foreclosures is between 2009 and 2012, and it's on page 19 in the booklet. For example, 
Neighborhoods that had 75% African American home ownership account for just 12% of the total number of census tracts in the entire region. These uh, tracts accounted for 21% of the total number of foreclosures, and that translates to about 94 foreclosures per census tract in African American neighborhoods. In comparison, Neighborhoods with 25% or less African American home ownership rates account for 63% of the total number of census tracts in the region. These tracts accounted for 45% of the total number of foreclosures, or roughly 38 foreclosures per census tract. So a difference between 94 foreclosures uh, per census tract in African American neighborhoods and about 38 foreclosures in those with 25% uh, or less African American population. Given the fact that there are three times as many white homeowners in the region as there are African American, the concentration of foreclosures in predominantly African American neighborhoods is reason for serious consideration as to the future of wealth building opportunities provided in minor to minorities in our region. Even if foreclosures represented nothing more than a one-time cost to the families, these findings would be very troubling. But the costs are extensive. Uh, multifaceted and long-term, extending far beyond individual families to their neighborhoods, their neighbors, communities, the cities, and the states. To have this damage concentrated in the same neighborhoods that we have historically underinvested in is devastating. I hope that what you can see is that we still have two systems in place. Where, one where private and stable, inexpensive financing is available to allow middle-class families to create wealth and one where we developed public housing without the opportunity for wealth creation and private financing and wealth creation still fall short. Both systems took public investment, but the opportunities that they've created for citizens are vastly different and the lingering financial and social costs are huge. My final observation is this, Public policy on housing established these systems and the very real fears that integration caused property values to drop. The legacy is much lower home ownership rates for African Americans in the region. The most recent data shows this isn't changing post-housing crisis. In the city of Richmond, where 40% of the population is white, whites received 70% of the home purchase and refinance loans in 2013. The wealth and prosperity of the region depends on creating opportunities for stability and wealth creation for our families and for all of our families. And building a housing system that supports that goal is really critical. And that's all. <laughs> that's enough. I'm going to. Well, continuing our overview, I don't know whether this is a good segue for a bank executive. <laughs> <laughs> but you're a brave man, Victor Branch, who has a new job of being the market president for Bank of America and sharing his perspective. Thank you. Thank you I am a, a brave soul to come behind <laughs> Heather after those sobering statistics. Tom, thank you. Thank you, Richmond Times Dispatch. Again, my name is Victor Branch, and I wear two hats today. One as the uh, Bank of America leader in the Richmond region, and my paid full-time job, but my other job, full-time job, is serving on the board of Housing Opportunities Made Equal, which I have uh, been a part of that organization since the mid-90s, and am so proud of the work that they have produced over these many, many years, and this research is one of the pieces, one of our crowning pieces, and to have Dr. Mieser um, help us with telling this story is just that much more powerful. So um, I come to you with my passion for e fair and equal housing. And uh, I don't carry the whole industry's weight on my shoulders today, <laughs> uh, given our history and given those statistics. But I say the future is bright. So that's where, that's where I come from. Um, Again, it's one, it's, it's a, it's, this conversation is one that we don't talk about very often, and I'm certain in this room we've learned something that changed how we think about this question, is Richmond neighborhood still segregated? The inspiring thing about realizing that our segregated 
patterns are the result of policy decisions is that we have the opportunity to change them. We own this people. There are things that we can do to have a more prosperous and integrated community. <coughs> Chief among them are the development of more affordable housing in high opportunity neighborhoods. And for my industry, providing credit and home ownership opportunities to everyone in the community. It makes good business sense. Thank you. As I indicated, I've been a proud member of the Board of Housing Opportunities Made Equal for many years because fair housing has the power to transform communities. In addition to their critical work enforcing the fair housing laws, they also provide much needed services to vulnerable populations in our community. Home provides home ownership education to about 300 low and moderate income individuals annually and also provides foreclosure prevention services with the support of banks like Bank of America to those 300 individuals. This work is critical to getting to the inequalities we just heard about. Brandeis University released a 25-year study in 2013 <coughs> that featured on the front page of the Washington Post. Sorry, Tom, one of your competitors. <laughs> it demonstrated why lagging home ownership rates by African Americans and lagging property values in African American neighborhoods matter. They tracked 1,700 individuals for 25 years and found that the total wealth gap between the white and African American families nearly tripled, increasing from 85,000 in 1984 to 236,000 in 2009. Their key finding was, the, was that the biggest cause of those inequities was from the difference in housing. In particular, they cited as the largest factors as having the ability to live in neighborhoods where values are likely to increase and the number of years of ownership. We have to figure out how to take on these issues as a community. And I know that Richmond, happy RVA, has <laughs> the ability to do this. In the end, to have a prosperous and dynamic region, we need to make sure that we build communities where everyone has the ability to succeed so that we harness the talents and the potential of all of us. That means honoring this history. As Richmond does so well, we know how to honor our history. <laughs> but also not continue practices and patterns that have us divided and stand in the way of creating the best possible future. It means harnessing the innovation and the ability to change that is the best part of Richmond. It means confronting and removing barriers that limit opportunities for those who find themselves disadvantaged and discriminated against. I stand here telling you I'm proud that Bank of America is part of this vibrant community and we are ready to take on these opportunities with you and to make a difference in this community. Thank you for having me today. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Well, thank you, Victor. We'll continue the uh, overview one more time from the man who just used lots of exclamation points to the man who uses lots of question marks. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Michael Paul Williams, will you please join me and give your perspective. Um, you've been covering this a long time, and you are the native Richmonder here. You just heard three overviews. You can stand up, Mike. It's OK. <laughs> it's all right. I'm going to give you the microphone, too. You've heard the perspectives from uh, Mike. One of the things we've added on our public square is the featuring those who get it done here. And our, certainly our journalists in our newsroom does that. And Michael's one of the best. But you heard the perspectives from the history and from the situations that have changed and also the commercial aspect of it. 
you're an objective journalist, but you have a column. You've seen them on both sides. What's your perspective on this issue? Well, I mean, you've heard from the experts. Um, all I can really bring to this is my personal perspective. Um, I've lived this in my lifetime, um, but going back to my childhood. Uh, I lived in one of those neighborhoods. It was hard to tell from the map, but it certainly appeared that it was a red line neighborhood. Could you point it out, Mike? Where, where, um, where did you live? Well, I lived in Bird Park. Okay. I lived, um, back then we called it the West End. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, the real West End. And um, we lived in a, uh, I lived in a house less than a half a block from Fountain Lake in Bird Park. And beautiful neighborhood for a kid to grow up in in the 19, late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, totally black neighborhood. And at some point my mom told me that when she moved into the neighborhood in the <laughs> 1950s, um, as it turns out, not coincidentally, after Brown, and when a lot of these forces were at work, um, she was the second ho black homeowner to purchase a house in that neighborhood. This was Maplewood Avenue. And six months later, it was an entirely black community. So that, that speaks to the block busting that, that was going on. Um, so, but I didn't know that. I was a kid. I was delighted to live in, in such close proximity to Bird Park, Maymont Park, uh, I guess probably at one point I may have wondered, why do we have such a great neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> why, would, why would anyone give this up? <laughs> so um, it was paradise. And I lived this paradise for the first nine or ten years of my life, and then I was told we were moving. And I was just crestfallen. I mean, for one, I was leaving my friends, but I was also leaving this wonderful environment. And you know, around this time, we just started hearing talk about the expressway, the expressway. And they were building the downtown expressway, and it would shave off a, a, a good chunk of, of Bird Park um, near the lake, um, take out blocks of Grayland and, and, and Parkwood Avenue um, up until, I didn't think I ever needed a mic. Um, <laughs> um, the barber shop that I would go to was on Davis Avenue. Uh, between Rosewood and, and Idlewood. That was gone. Some of the homes were, were taken out. So um, our home would not have been spared. It was spared. It stayed to this day. My mom's like, I can't, I can't deal with this construction. My nerves are bad. I don't want to be a part of this. We're moving. So in October 1967, we moved out to Henrico County, out to Glen Allen, old Glen Allen, the real Glen Allen. <laughs> but lest you think that this, this represented some time, we're, oh, okay, we have, we're, we're close to the Fair Housing Act, and they're moving out to this integration. No, the, the neighborhood we moved out into in Henrico was every bit as black as the neighborhood we left in the West End. It was off Hungry Road. It was, it was developed by a gentleman, and it was named for Middleton G., a black developer. <coughs> so I moved from one neighborhood to the next, and it's was a very nice neighborhood, new homes, um, some of the most prominent um, African Americans in Richmond. Judge Sheffield lived across the street. Um, I could name others. Um, and that was where I lived. And just kind of a little post note, um, a few years after we moved out, what would be one of the few really concentrated public housing communities that I would ever see in Henrico was built right behind our neighborhood which try to imagine that. I mean, our neighborhood at one point in the 1960s was being like pointed to as an example of one of the most affluent uh, black neighborhoods in, in, in the South. And here we have a public housing community going up right behind it, which I guess speaks to the kind of investment and disinvestment that was going on. So that's my story. Hey, Michael, thank you. Take, you've been taking a lot of notes. Are you writing about this tomorrow? Um, no, I have another topic. Okay. <laughs> don't we all? Don't we all? Before we go to the audience, you've heard our overview, and that was the first part of the public square, but Michael Herring is here, and you've heard a lot about patterns and perspectives. Uh, you've heard a lot about maps and history. Uh, you, there was a reference to you about the other side of the equation here. Can you speak to that before we go to the audience? And thanks very much for being here. Sure. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. I've seen this 
two or three times now, and uh, I too am a native Richmonder. My experience doesn't perfectly mirror Michael's, but it's not terribly dissimilar. I grew up on Miller Avenue in Battery Park, had a wonderful experience. Um, I will say, though, that the last time I saw this exhibit, I was at a totally unrelated function. And there was a fellow from home showing this data so that folks could overlay it onto the problem, if you will, of schools. And you all know I'm the Commonwealth's attorney for the city, and so I'm in the business of fighting crime. I like to say I'm in the business of felonization. <laughs> My, Mike and I have exchanged emails about that. It's mostly him listening to me exchange emails about that. But, I, you know, the last time I was watching this fella, Brian, present this data, I have to admit to you, a light bulb goes off. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, where have I seen these images before? And I knew I'd seen them through Heather's presentation, but then it occurred to me, I've seen them at intel meetings with the police department. There are two other slides in your booklet, mm -hmm. but that, that Heather did not show on the big screen. And one is on page 21. The other is on page 23. The image on page 21 shows poverty rate and school segregation. The image on page 23 shows what I like to call opportunity deserts and poverty reservoirs. What's fascinating to me is that the concentration of violent crime and therefore the disproportionate consumption of taxpayer dollars for crime fighting is in the same areas where you see the opportunity deserts and the disparity in income and educational resources. And so I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, what is the implication for me? And what I have come to conclude, and this is probably not going to sit well with a lot of folks in this audience, is that the business that I am in is a business to nowhere. People grade law enforcement, uh, the effectiveness of law enforcement in several ways. One of them is to eliminate or reduce crime. Another is to reduce offenders, uh, eliminate offenders from the community. And the principal way that we do that is to incarcerate them or felonize them. Felons cost you money whether you incarcerate them or support them as second-class citizens down the road, felons are more expensive because their capacity to yield is significantly diminished as a result of the felony. The felony rate in the opportunity deserts is sky high. The felony rate in the areas where there's so much disparity in income and educational resources is sky high. And so I'm, I'm really struggling with how to, fig how to do this. But I've got a feeling that Richmond is going to derive a much higher yield if we felonize as a last resort. At, well, wait, wait a minute, because it's complicated. <laughs> as opposed to letting felonies be the default. And you don't have time for me to go on and on about this, but I don't know how to do it yet because we don't have systemic alternatives to the crime fighting model that we have in place. Tell you what, you come back, we'll deal with that conversation next. Sure. <laughs> so that's sort of my perspective on this. Okay. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. That was that was the overview of the longtime scholar of urban planning and who's been looking at this for years, the advocate and the attorney who's been, who's been watching this go through the courts and the reality is measured by maps. The new top banker in town who's got a perspective from a nonprofit, but more importantly from a bank that's also investing in neighborhood progress. The longtime journalist who's a native who's still trying to process where he lived. <laughs> attorney who boldly admits that he's still trying to figure out and I have a good reason as to why you might be here as well so 
Myself and Paige Mudd, as the managing editor of the Richmond Times Dispatch, will have the mics. Here's the deal. You've got an unusual array of subject matter experts here. There's a lot of people in the room. The two rules of the public square is keep your questions, your observations short, and be respectful and make room for somebody else. So who wants to open up the conversations? Okay. I'm going to go to you first and then you second. Yes, sir. Do you want to step out? And the other rule is, please state your name, and if you have a green card, oh, sorry, it's, now it's blue, the blue card, please give it to me, and everything is on the record. <laughs> <laughs> Up with that. Hi, my name is Ted Groves. I'm the uh, Kids Count Director at Voices for Virginia's Children, and I'll try to keep my comments as short as possible here. Um, we monitor the well-being of Virginia's children um, by uh, each locality over time on about 100 uh, indicators of child well-being. And we're in the middle of producing a report that um, looks at the disparity of um, child economic uh, well-being through a lens of uh, race, uh, place, and um, family structure. And if we look at you know, how children are doing in Virginia overall, uh, things look reasonably okay, but when we disaggregate this data by race, place, and family structure, we see these huge disparities um, in poverty and near poverty, and those uh, factors kind of interrelated. Um, one of the areas that we see an effect on uh, children is uh, segregation and um, uh, poverty, and particularly in education. Education's always been the cornerstone of freedom and uh, uh, democracy and uh, economic security, but our children are hampered by segregated neighborhoods with um, locally controlled schools, largely locally funded schools uh, that are segregated by race and socioeconomic status. 71% um, of the black children in Virginia go to predominantly black schools. That's quite a bit of segregation in this day and age. Um, and those, um, those schools are largely underfunded, and um, we have see, segregated urban schools with concentrated poverty. And research shows us that children just do not do well in schools with concentrated poverty. The education research since almost 1966 with the Coleman Report says that the largest influence for performance of kids is concentrated poverty in the schools, more so than the individual poverty status of kids. The children in Virginia, uh, disadvantaged children, uh, have twice the disparity level of children that aren't disadvantaged in reading at the third grade level. And we know that reading is important at the third grade level for long-term success and academic success of kids. Uh, to sort of sum it up real quick, since I know we're pressed for time, let me just say that um, segregated neighborhoods result in segregated schools, which results in segregated outcomes for kids by race and socioeconomic status. Good. Reaction from the panel? Anybody? Feel free to jump in on anything. And if you don't get a direct question or something that you want to key on, I'm going to go over here, Paige, unless you have somebody. I was going to go over here. Okay. Excuse me. Oh. Actually, you probably can get there by the time. Yes, sir. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Walt Pulliam. I'm from Henrico. Well, you got a soft voice, so you're going to have to face I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, Walt Pulliam exactly. from Henrico. And my question would be for any of the panelists, uh, how does regentrification, such as Churchill or Woodland Heights, play into this issue? Good question. Modeling behavior, only having a question, by the way, I might add. Uh, I wanted, whoever, whoever wants to jump in there, good question. Well, let me stand up so that everybody can so that I can see you. Um, that's a very good question. Walt, Walt Pullum and I are good friends, and uh, that's a very good question. Gentrification of neighborhoods is contributing to suburban poverty. The, uh, the increases in rents in many of the neighborhoods as income goes up, and income is going up in many of heretofore high-poverty census tracts. Income is going up, poverty is going down in, in some of those census tracts, and there are only two places where 
people now can find any supply of affordable housing. One place is South Richmond, but most often and where you have the greatest supply are the inner suburbs of Enrico and Chesterfield County. And so what you have is as the uh, income goes up in the city, and in some cases as poverty begins to go down, it's like squeezing a balloon. The poverty begins to spread out into the suburbs. And in those areas, income just crashes. Um, the fortunes now between the city and the suburb have been completely reversed. Um, but to put a positive note on this, I view right now gentrifying neighborhoods as a wonderful opportunity if we will take advantage of it. Fundamentally, in my view, what we need are mixed income neighborhoods. No more separation, no more segregation, where people live in community, people of different incomes. Now, if we very purposely develop affordable housing in those gentrifying census tracts, you can achieve that. So, and I know I'll, I've seen people here from nonprofit uh, uh, affordable housing organizations. We have some terrific uh, housing nonprofits. And so this is being discussed. And um, I think we have an opportunity, but we've got to act quickly and deliberately. Thank, Thank you. you. We have a question in the back here, and Paige will get on that side, and I'll walk over here. So as I look at the history in this, I'm Martha Rollins. Uh, I live in Richmond, Virginia, in Bird Park. Same house for 45 years. Um, belong to the Caroline Civic Association, which is sort of an exciting history in this housing thing. Um, but looking at the history of our country and our city, so much of where we are today has been intentional, beginning in the 1600s, and how and money trumping humanity. <clears throat> and I just wonder if it's time for some way to throw into the mix the question of restitution in a way that we could not just change policy, but try to make amends for our many, many mistakes. Thank you. I've got to go over here. I'll come back. Does anybody from the panel want to take that on? <laughs> okay. But, but I will I say this. Uh, the single best article that I have ever read that in a very short space chronologues this entire history uh, is an article that appeared last fall in The Atlantic. And the title of that article is The Case for Reparations. If you haven't read it, I really encourage you to read it. It is a it's a very powerful article, very powerful. And, um, but what that article does, Martha, is directly answer your question. And it, it, and it is yes. And it very clearly ties the case for reparations to the inequities in housing. Um, and a lot of the same structural issues that I talked about in this region, you know, it wasn't just Richmond, it was, it was all, every major urban area. Um, and that article is really, I'll second that, it's fantastic. Pedro in the corner. Uh, good evening. Good evening. My name is David Lindsay. Uh, I'm from Richmond, Virginia, residence all my life. Uh, started in West End, moved to Highland Park, and now I live in Gillen Park. And um, I'm a graduate of John Marshall High School. I have a, a scholarship fund in my name that I give every year for education. And my question is for uh, Mr. Hearn and maybe someone who is in the education field here that maybe can uh, help me with this. But I see forth that to uh, a better solution for this problem for me 
is educating the kids. And by educating your kids, then you're going to get a better person. And with that better person, they may not stay within that region. They may not be trapped within that region, uh, as we call uh, public housing. And uh, through your education, you have a better person. And with that better person, people like Michael Hearn may, ha may have to deal with. So uh, I wonder if support, more support towards the education field with our kids to, to better them, making better people so they can have better lives. Maybe that would be the solution to this housing problem that we have because they brought up the fact about uh, low income and through low income, you know, that's, that's because lack of education. You know, I, I think Mr. Lindsay has a, has a valid point. My understanding of the amount of money we spend to edu Brian, educate a child as compared to the amount of money you spend to incarcerate a person is that the latter is multiples of the former. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me because it says you're spending money on the back end to correct a harm that is almost irreparable if the person's convicted of a felony because it has lifetime consequences. So I, I think that we're likely to get a much higher yield if we spend the money on the front end in areas of education. But it's, we have to resist the temptation to grab on to catchy sound bites that it's easy to get behind, right? <laughs> and so it's easy to say, put more money in education. It's a lot harder to figure out how to spend that money effectively. As, as my mother used to say to me, you don't, what is it, you don't throw good money after bad, right? And I, I think if, if, if people had the solution, we'd be implementing it. That there aren't many school districts around the country that have figured out how to correct the harm done by underperforming or low performing districts which happen to be in areas of low resource. Finally, the reparation idea, Ms. Martha, is, it is one that it's easy to get behind in spirit, but the idea of writing checks to individuals is a non-starter for purposes of public discussion. I do think, though, that you could do it in kind. You don't have to write checks to people, you can invest in communities. So wherever on page 23, you see a vast opportunity desert. It is a form of reparation, restitution, to incentivize investment in those areas so you don't have poverty displacement. You have people staying in those communities employed, and they are less likely, from my perspective, to offend. Good. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Paul Fleischer, and I'm from the Richmond Peace Education Center. And I have a short answer question for each of the panelists. And if possible, I would also like to include uh, Dr. Thad Williamson, who's uh, the head of the Mayor's Anti-Poverty Initiative as well in this question. What one uh, our representative from Bank of America mentioned that we needed some change in public policy, but you didn't specify. So what one change in public policy would each of you like to see done to change um, the issue of segregation and, and desegregate the Richmond area? When you get called out, we give you a mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I don't have that one bullet answer, but I, I, I will say that a lot of what I'm coming from is public-private partnerships. And Obviously, I'm standing here as a private citizen representing a, a public company, but we come to the table with resources to help address these issues, and we are involved with the public policy makers in discussions about how to come to some solutions for these problems that we're facing. But it, it is a conversation, it is a, and it is a discussion that we all should be a part of, and, and we won't just sit back and expect things to happen. And I'm a big believer I, that, that I would pr promote. Yeah, I, I won't stand here and tell you today I have a, a policy change that, because that would just probably turn off half the room. 
I'm saying we're going to have a collaborative discussion to address these issues. And it won't be Bank of America's solution or just the public solution. It will be collectively all of our solution. And that's how we're going to approach solving our problems. Other panel? I, I'll, I have two. Okay. Um, the first thing I would say is, uh, you know, obviously I believe we need to be vigorously enforcing the Fair Housing Act. Uh, and I think that systematic enforcement of the Fair Housing Act against institutions is also critically important. But I also think that tax credits and, uh, and subsidies that we give to develop affordable housing should be higher when you're placing affordable housing in communities of opportunity. So the lower poverty the area, that's the place where we should be targeting uh, uh, development of affordable housing. And, and we should increase our federal and, and other supports that we have for that development more so in, a, in the neighborhoods that are already thriving to help us deconcentrate poverty. Okay. John, anything there? Y yes, uh, and this relates to some of the work that Thad Williamson, whom I assume that you're going to hear from in just a moment, who uh, heads a newly created office in the city of Richmond, the Office of Community Wealth Building, which flows right out of the uh, Maggie Walker Community Wealth Building Initiative. What we are planning and what I think can be a major uh, a major factor to create wealth in high poverty neighborhoods is using the procurement powers of major institutions like VCU, University of Richmond, Dominion Resources, Federal Reserve, and I could go on and on. Now, what does this mean? In fact, this is one of the key recommendations um, for uh, addressing poverty. It would mean that, take VCU Health Sciences, that instead of contracting out of state for brooms, that what about creating a small business in a high poverty neighborhood where those who would like to be part of a new business learn how to make a broom. And more particularly, as that business gets underway, the people who are working in that business own it. They become, it becomes a workers' cooperative. We are modeling what we'd like to do in Richmond after what is already happening in Cleveland. It's really quite exciting. But what that does, the more people who are employed, the more people in high poverty neighborhoods who own their own small business, it circulates wealth within that community. What we see so often is that these high poverty neighborhoods are hemorrhaging wealth. For example, just food stamp money, the amount of food stamp money that leaks out from these neighborhoods because of the lack of grocery stores. They have to go someplace else. So that's my candidate for really making a big difference, namely the use of anchor institutions to help develop small businesses. Okay. The aforementioned Mr. Williamson, now we're calling out audience members as well, but <laughs> we'll welcome it. Give you a chance. Thank you. I'm Thad Williamson, for the director of the Mayor's Office of Community Wealth Building. Uh, Paul, thanks for the shout out and the invitation to to weigh in on in this excellent discussion. What we've learned through this community process of the Maggie Walker Initiative is that there's not a single strategy. It would be misleading to, to, to suggest that. It's a holistic picture. All these things are clearly related between housing, education, economic opportunity. They all have to be tracked at the same time, tackled at the same time. But uh, it's important to know that your city does have an office it's implementing a strategic plan. To, to tackle all these things at once. It's just important for the community to understand the magnitude of what that means. And this is, we all understand this is a long-term effort. And we in the administration work on this have a heavy responsibility to get it off to the best possible start, which, which we're doing our best to do. But there are five pieces of it, I think, each one of which are transformational, especially taken together. So one, the social enterprise piece that Dr. Mises just mentioned. Second, the start of a potential regional transportation system that we have the opportunity to do that with, with the BRT project, game changing. Third, my office has done a lot of work with Richmond Public Schools on developing a better plan for early childhood. Clearly, that's a key area from any anti-poverty perspective where a lot more resources need to go and, and a lot more intelligent application of what we do have. So we have a, a collaboration called the Richmond Early Childhood Cabinet already up and running with the schools. Fourth, uh, I see Kim Bridges in the back 
has helped pioneers along with other, a lot of other people is this concept of RVA Future, which would be a, the a beginning of a Promise Scholarship Program. So if the budget passes in its current form, starting next year in the high schools, there will be dedicated future centers to connect students starting in ninth grade and have a conversation every year with every student in those high schools about their life after high school and understanding there is life after high school and you have to begin planning for it now and understanding what's the difference between a pipe dream and a realistic plan and understanding that your choices and performance, even in ninth grade, have long-term consequences. Again, RPS has fully been on board with that, so we're very, very excited about that and, and we hope to add a scholarship component uh, uh, to that. Um, fifth piece, the hardest, most complicated, you'll need many forms, public housing transformation. It's the directly topic, the, the target. How do you actually undo this legacy? Extremely hard, because there's a development component and there's a human being component. And historically, the human being component has not been done well at all. So if it's going to happen, as the mayor is committed, it has to be, every piece of it has to be done well, especially the first time, so it's a model for the future. Again, a big challenge, a, a lot of challenging issues involved, both the resource point of view and the strategy point of view. We're going to need the entire community behind it and engaged in it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dad. Appreciate it. Paige, I'm back. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Roy Bryant. I, was, I lived here in Chesterfield, and I was raised up in public housing. Thank God for public housing when I was raised up in it. Quite a few people became very successful from the public housing. When they were doing what they had to do to guide us and guide the parents to raise us in a way that uh, you attend the school and got the education. But I came here today is to say, a lot of you in this room done caused the problem that we are in. A lot of you in this room is causing the problem that we are going to remain in. Yes, it is intentionally being done as we speak right now. How can you deconsecrate poverty, moving people all the way around on the edge of the city between Henrecker and Chesterfield, and then making the place look like a hostess cupcake, chocolate on the outside, and white all in the middle of it. Why are you doing this type of situation? A lot of your universities are the ones that are training the people that come out and do the planning in, in your planning in your cities. And I talked to you, Mr. John uh, Misa, that y'all need to do something about the universities. This is where a lot of this stuff is coming from. Okay, now, yet, is that a question? Or uh, it's a question and an answer, too. <laughs> so I want you to know that get into your university and train those individuals that can have some sympathy for the community that is at large. I came down uh, by the home, the elderly home, just recently on the way here, and half of them is sitting on the outside of the elderly home. You, you talk about bus transportation. You took the grandmamas and threw them all out there into a, a, took them off of Broad Street and put them down. I just don't understand it. After all these years, I done came back around to see all this stuff coming back again. Okay, so it's the same thing. I'm through, and I thank you for letting me come in here to say what I had to say. <laughs> but get thank the old to the university. Now, now, now everyone has to answer their own question. The new precedent. Okay. <laughs> Would you like? I, I've got one over here, Paige, and I'll go to you next. Um, I'm Andrea Ukrop, and I'm a citizen of Chesterfield. And um, I had a question, and I guess it was um, answered a little bit um, around, um, I believe you said Cleveland was a model. Um, but, you know, from what I've kind of understood is um, Interstate 95 kind of did a red line all the way down um, the coast. And I was just wondering, especially about other southern cities, um, any strides that they have made in desegregating their communities and then especially around the public housing, how, um, you know, have people been given vouchers to, you know, integrate, you know, within, um, um, I guess, regular income, you know, integrate within the community rather than being segregated in other areas? Sure. <laughs> 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 
Let's just look at that I-95 corridor that you refer to. Um, you know, I wish I could stand up here and point to a city that has done it right. Um, frankly, I think all cities are having this same conversation. And um, um, that they're all dealing with the public housing matter. And I'm so glad that you mentioned the importance of public housing when it was created. It helped a lot of people. Um, but simply having all the poor live on an island is devastating to them and the rest of us. Uh, and, and cities where you have large amounts of public housing uh, are, are trying to develop mixed income housing as we are here. Norfolk, for example, as a matter of fact, there was, uh, I see Lily Estes here when the uh, uh, Mayor's Anti-Poverty Commission was wrapping up. Uh, there was a whole section on public housing and Lily, I think you went on a bus with others who were focusing on public housing to Norfolk to look at what they are doing and it, uh, the, the reports that came back really were very positive. You might even want to say something about that. the conversation. My name is Lily Estes. I'm a community strategist in the community. I want to thank you, Mr. Silvestri, for this public square addressing this. Um, Dr. Misa and I, we agree on many things, but on deconcentration of poverty, we don't agree. Um, I do believe that there's great um, effort in trying to correct the harm that um, was done by the intentional moving of African American people, poor people in public housing, and how we correct that going forward. We really, and I want to applaud all the people in the room here, but I want to also ask you, I don't like the word challenge, but I want to ask you to really do your own homework. You have to really look at what's been happening and how we apply remedy to time-specific issues. We can't run in front of and try to solve something without the current information on the ground now. Deconcentration of poverty in a community where 26 percent that we are talking about of poverty in this city, people cannot afford. It was intentionally done. We have to tell ourselves the truth about what was done people in different institutions. This is institutional intention, discrimination, generational neglect over and over, mutated, disaffected, whatever other kind of metaphor we want to use to describe this. And we have to correct it at the fundamental root in the time frame of how to correct, you can't, uh, let me just say this real quick. I worked on trying to get a documentary on the life of Oliver Hill created years ago. And during massive resistance, when they closed the schools down in Prince Edward County, we were trying to um, interview some of the people that were affected by that. But what really struck out with me is that, you know, you take somebody who stopped school in the seventh, eighth, twelfth grade, close the school down for five years, come back, reopen the school, their life really hasn't been changed that much. But when you talk about the irreparable harm of closing the school for five years for a child that's been in kindergarten and they go back to school in the fifth or sixth grade, they don't have the fundamentals. Those, that's what we're looking at. When you fall off the cliff of trying to educate people and then come back and try to repair that remedy with dysfunctional, functional obsolescence kinds of things. We got to be truthful about what we're doing and I hope that we can have more of these town halls to talk about solutions of where we go with solving this realistically. It ain't about the money, 
you know, we can have all concentrated black communities. I ain't trying to move in your community at all, but I want appropriate resources in my community among my cultural people that we deserve. That's on a reparation. Thank you. Kate. <laughs> Charles will tell you, and um, I love this kind of stuff. You know, I think uh, racism has brought about segregation. I'm not an angry black man. I'm not running my head talking about white folks, this, white folks, that. Because that would be unfair to say all white folks is this. Without, if, if I could say all white folks is something, it would be unfair to say, or to say all black folks is something. You can't never say all about anything because you don't know all. But what I do know is that I've been around here 60 years, and because of racism, we have subliminal stuff in the back of our mind that brings about segregation. I'm from church. I was, I, I was raised in the West End. I was raised in Churchill, in Shimaraza. And when I go over Churchill now, but I, but I understand the history. You understand? I understand because at first, white people was predominantly over in Churchill. Then black folks became predominantly over Churchill. Now white folks again. You understand? <laughs> When I go to 7 Eleven in the morning, I may be one or two or three people that speaks English in 7 Eleven. I think I'm a foreigner in 7 Eleven in the morning. You understand? But I know that racism exists in our society. And I think racism exists here, but I think we are getting better as people. I think when the old heads die off, it'll be a little better. Because the, the young people ain't getting up here and talking about black, white, they talk about economics and how to live and love each other. We are still stuck. The older people are still stuck into that racism mindset, the segregationist mindset. You know, I, I love all people, man, because I, I think if, if everybody afford the same opportunity, we can prosper. You know, I'm going to close with this. All the black folks are left from church here. Well, I can't say all, but a whole bunch of them. I would like to know where they're going. <laughs> you know, between, 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 between VCU and somebody that's been in the condo or an apartment building over church, I know it ain't cheap. Where have all the black folks gone? Thank you. <laughs> Michael. Michael. Michael, use, use the mic because it's on broadcast. <laughs> I might be able to answer part of that. I'm no expert, or, or, but there are more black people in the suburbs now than in the, in the city itself, by far. So that's where they went. And if they, and one thing, the question was raised about one po what policy, one policy we would, I would in, be in favor of to change things. I don't think you can change things if the, the structural framework for what got us here is still here. I would blow up this independent city. I think a lot of what's facilitated what we're talking about is the fact that we have jurisdictions that function like balkanized nations. And there are these artificial walls, and you don't see it in any other state but Virginia. So I'd blow up the independent cities thing. Richmond needs to be part of Henrico. Maybe Southside needs to be part of Chesterfield, but it just doesn't make any sense, and it enables a lot of what we've talked about, in my view. Um, my name is uh, Dale Jones, and I've lived here in Richmond since 1964. And uh, <coughs> I have an answer, um, partially, why is Richmond still segregated? And it's very simple, because the majority of the people want it that way. Okay. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> That means until you change the heart of the individual, just go out on Sunday morning in Richmond and see where people go to church. They go to segregated churches, and until that's changed, you're not going to change segregation. Okay, All right. appreciate that comment. Yeah. We're in the back. Yes, my name is Winnie Westbrook, and I uh, have lived in Richmond since 76. And I live in a neighborhood that is primarily or all white. Um, I think that I want to say this as succinctly as I can. 
and it comes first from what my pastor has said, is that you can put perfume on a pig. You can put flowers on a pig, you can put bows and ribbons on a pig, but the bottom line is that it's still a pig. And the pig for me is fear. And fear of race, fear of poverty, and fear of felons. And uh, moving into your neighborhood. And um, my question is to uh, Michael, uh, there is a, um, this ban the box, uh, which I think is good legislation. How do we get folks beyond the pig of fear, uh, poverty, and the felons to just say, I, I'm going to take a chance. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a chance, or I'm not fearful. I can hire this person that would certainly have an impact on education, that would certainly have an impact on housing. And also, if we had MCV, since we have such a transportation problem, why can't MCV or any of the other schools have technical schools where the folks are who can benefit from them? That is, in the city, that are designed to create jobs in a technical career and technical education, in my opinion, is very important. Are and so asked, all of, so, okay, so. You, you asked two, yes, there's two mics. Yes. Which one do you want to? <coughs> Herring. Oh, my, Michael Herring, okay. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I want to make um, it clear that ban the box is an important piece of legislation. I suggested that to Michelle Mosby, and she followed through with that. But I don't hear about it. I hear that the um, state has embraced that, but is it being, in, I mean, are we using that? The, the, the point of, of Ban the Box and, and similar initiatives is to ensure against discrimination of felons. In other words, to make sure that a person gets a look notwithstanding a felony conviction. And I think that makes sense, to be honest. But as you have no doubt figured out with me, I don't have many simple answers. And so it, it far be it for me to impose my value judgment on another agency or institution. I will hire felons in the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, but I know prosecutors around the state who won't. And I can understand why they aren't comfortable doing it. Culturally, Virginians and I think Americans have a misinformed view of felons. We tend to think a felon is a felon and a f is a felon, and that is not the case. So when we come back, or when you all begin to, uh, when you're ready for a real substantive conversation about your justice system, and more importantly, the impact of felonization, I think that's a better time to take up the question of how we overcome the fear or live with felons. Okay, thank you. Paige and back. Yes, sir. We're also getting us to the 90 minute mark, so we yes, can keep yes. our comments brief. Short and succinct. Uh, how many people hate racism? Raise your hand. How many people have issues with the black white thing? Raise your hand. What does that mean? Solution. Uh, uh, getting, uh, uh, the, the friction that's caused between so people who call themselves white and black, okay. you know? Right. Uh, solution. Throw out the concept of race. Stop defining the human being by these terms black and white. I'm a son of Adam. We're all children of Adam. Mankind is divided into tribes and nationalities. Now, wait a minute. Race is an invention. You, weren't you at the last public school? I'm going to be at everyone that, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You've got 15 seconds. Cause all right. You've already been but, but, on but, it. But, but let's look at this concept of race and let's not buy into it, and let's stop defining. Every person knows that ethnic and tribal identity. Right. Stop ganging up on my people who have been robbed of their identity. And uh, my people, please, come up, let's come up with a name for ourselves. Okay, right. thank you. Okay. Ray Muhammad. Thank you. <laughs> thought I recognized you. Hi, my name is Greg Hill, and I'm directing this question to you. Um, 
How do we change police behavior when it comes to dealing with uh, people of color like myself? Um, say I'm going to 7-Eleven to get a cup of coffee. I decide to run, I get shot in the back of the head. What are we doing about this? Uh, police, policing poverty area, but I live in Chesterfield. I'm from Powhatan, so my greatest fear when I get up in the morning, can I make it back home? Or if I get pulled over the road, I have to tell a police officer I'm reaching into my glove compartment, not for my gun, but for my driver's license. You know, so I, that's my issue. Okay. Could you give me a solution? <laughs> Tom, right? Or who said that? I, I think Tom has confirmed that that is the next public square. I don't know if it's the next, but it's, we'll it's coming. Talk. It's coming. <laughs> I want to commit my staff, but it's a good topic talk. We got time for one or two more questions um, in the back over there. Okay. Hi, my name is Nichelle Carver. I had to write this down so I wouldn't mess up. Um, I live in eastern Henrico in the Verona area, and I'm in a middle-class suburb that's predominantly African-American. In fact, there's only one family that's not out of the 300 homes. Um, and my question is, my home, I heard on NPR that just by virtue of my neighborhood being predominantly African-American, our home values are lower. So the same size home in Glen Allen is worth more than my home. And I guess my question is, what can we do on a community level to try to make these assessments more equal or fair? Heather, you had, want to take a shot at it? That's a complicated... It's, that's yeah. very complicated. I'll just, I mean, the main thing I can do is just confirm that. And I think it's a legacy of, of inferior financing and fear and fear of property values going down. It's very complicated. I think better integration would make a big difference. I think greater awareness of that fact would make a big difference. Um, I, I think, yeah, we need to change it, and it's true. We've got time for one more question. So I'm going to use the well, waving the hands is not going to win here. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you who have a question, give me a number between 1 and 10. Who said 8? You got the number. We're very scientific here at the Times Dispatch. <laughs> but please stay afterwards and ask your questions to the panel. Yes. My name is Mary Atkins. I'm a citizen of Richmond. As long as, I can, as long as I can hold out financially, I'd like to see something addressed more about um, the powers that be helping people keep their homes instead of opening the, rolling out the red carpet for people to shove them out. Anyone who thinks gentrification is a pleasant thing hasn't experienced it from the inside out. In six years, my house, I moved into cutesy town, a.k.a. Cary Town, um, because it was a mixed neighborhood. And it was beautiful, a working class neighborhood. It, now it's an open air strip mall. <laughs> I mean, plastic. No, the neighbors are not. They're, they're, why is um, flip sale artists even, why is that even allowed? I mean, 500% in six years. I never had a credit card in my 70 years. I never took out a loan. I never bought anything on time. Now, um, on welfare, I don't think I can stay in this city. I can see why everybody's leaving it. Uh, I want my neighbors back. Even the druggies and the shooters are better than what is coming in around me. With their all noses stuck up in the air, acting like I'm something that they ought to scrape off their feet. And I'm sorry to be so direct, but it's... It's painful to be on the wrong side of gentrification. I and understand. I think the government needs to address that. Appreciate your comments. Heather, yeah, no comment? Okay, thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. For, I just want to ask the panel, you've heard the conversation that followed your commentary. Anything surprise you? Or what are the future conversations that we need to have on this topic? John? And if you want to think, let Heather talk. Oh, yeah, I, you go ahead. <laughs> I, I just, I'm so grateful for everyone for coming out and having a passionate conversation about this. Um, I, I think it needs to be the start of many more and about purposefully how we redevelop housing and how we pay attention to how housing underlies, housing patterns underlie our educational system, our, you know, what happens with crime, and how we, if we make great decisions about housing and where we put it and what opportunities we give people, we can have the best possible region. John? First of all, this has been a magnificent turnout. 
And secondly, this has really been an engaged audience. And personally, I just want to say thank you for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I've enjoyed being with my good colleagues from home, Heather. What I heard is that the status quo isn't working. And we talked about transportation, we talked about housing, we've talked about um, any, uh, we've talked about crime, any number of matters. And what I see in this group is a wonderful mixed audience of caring citizens who would l really like to see change. And I guess the only thing that I would say in conclusion is that we are the change. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Michael, join me up here, my colleague from the Times Dispatch. Now that you're creating policy uh, on and all up, you guys, when it comes to writing in common, it's the beginning, we're at the end. What would be your ending for this, to con this conversation based on what you heard today? For the leadership, um, and not just the political leadership, but the corporate leadership to buy into some systemic change, and, and not just lip service it, but really engage in the work of transforming Richmond into a more just community for everyone. Okay. Michael William Paul Williams, and this is the Richmond Times Dispatch thanking you for coming out to the 56 Public Square. Thank you very much. Tune in for the next conversation. It might be with Michael Heron. Thank you.